Hello, Thaddeus here for XJW Bible Bites. This will be a treasure's consideration for 1 Samuel chapter 21. It's a shorter chapter, but there's a lot in here. Well, let us start with a reading. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him, and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us, as usual, whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day that it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, Don't you have a spear or sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon, because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, There is none like it, give it to me. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Look at the man, he is insane. Why did you bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? So... David was afraid, and he was acting out of fear, and he was acting out of the strength of his own hand. Fear is a seat of motivation for many other sins. David was afraid of what Saul and or Saul's minions would try to do to him, and he was afraid that others, like this priest Ahimelech, would not act to help him. So he had fear in multiple ways. Let's read Isaiah 57, 11. Whom have you dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me and have neither remembered me nor taken this to heart? Is it not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me? Why do we lie? Because we are fearful. Why are we fearful? because we've forgotten the fear of God. When we fear other things besides God, it opens up the gates for this sin to come up and mess up your life. You can be afraid of your livelihood being threatened, so you lie about a messed up work order to the client. You can be afraid of offending someone, so you lie about your opinion. You can be afraid of facing reality, so you lie to yourself. You can be afraid of being alone so you lie about who you are to lock down a supposed opportunity. It is a form of protection based in carnality and not in God. It was admirable that David went to the house of God, but he went for the wrong reason. He did not go to seek counsel from the living God or intercession by the priests. He was seeking temporary material relief through bread. This is what fear does. It bends someone out of shape from their normal method of operation. 
This bread was the holy bread of the presence, provided by the people and managed by the priests. The bread would sit in two piles of six, representing the twelve core tribes of Israel. The bread would sit uh, with frankincense on it until the Sabbath, at which point it would be eaten and replaced with fresh bread. There is, of course, connective symbolism between this bread, the showbread, presented before the Most High God, and the bread of life, Jesus Christ, who is a greater fulfillment of the provision of manna. In Leviticus, we read that this bread was for Aaron and his sons or descendants, and it was a holy portion, a perpetual food option set aside and reserved for the Levite priesthood. Was David a Levitical priest? No, he was of the tribe of Judah. David was not supposed to eat this bread. This bread represented the willingness of the Lord to offer fellowship to his children, despite their fallen nature. David could have turned around at this point and realized that God would be with him in fellowship if he sought God out. We'll consider more about this, but let's see what the Lord Jesus Christ actually had to say about this event in Matthew 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read that the law, or in the law, that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet they are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he heals the man, and they continue to plot to try to kill him. So were Jesus' disciples here actually breaking the law by plucking heads of grain? We'll consider that shortly. Firstly, though, it is important to note that the welfare of mankind, and apparently, in some cases, beasts of the field, is allowed to be put before the letter of the law, or the interpretation of the letter of the law. Mankind was not made for the law, but the law for the benefit of mankind. What is the greatest example of love and mercy being put forth before the consequences of law? That's Father God's grace given to sinners. The penalty for sin is what? Death. But did Jesus' disciples actually break the law, as the Pharisees accused them of doing? That's up Deuteronomy 23, verse 25. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. So, interestingly, here we see the disciples were actually doing exactly as according to the law of Moses. But the Pharisees wanted to operate under color of law in order to condemn others. So, Jesus brought out a superior example by making reference to David's actions. If the Pharisees had known the law, then they would have known better, or they did not expect Jesus to know enough to bring up this precedent. The Pharisees were clinging to their legalisms, man's law. Legalisms are laws that go above and beyond God's law or its principles. Man often uses legalisms in an attempt to override God's law. Why? Power, control, and dishonest gain. They believe that their legalisms hold greater importance and greater authority than what is written. Jesus, the reflection of his Father, provides an example of wiggle room here for man's need, or animal's need. The permission to neglect or even violate ceremonial laws 
in order to provide for God's children is here and said by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's provided for. Matthew 12, 11 brings us out where it's talking about which one of them would not save one of their livestock a monetary investment on the Sabbath. So how much more so should it be applicable to be able to help man or to do things for the benefit of man, even if it goes against the letter of the law? Now, Jesus is not promoting situational ethics. Good and wrong on a macro level do not change. However, the disciples in this case had not even broken the law. David did break the law. He did something unlawful. Why did Jesus use the case of David breaking the law in order to defend someone who was legally guiltless? This, in context, seems to be about holding the Pharisees to their hypocrisy. Jesus is calling for their conviction to be consistent. For example, under the law, the wages that sin pays is death. A sin equals death, according to the letter of the law. Do we ourselves really want to cling to this letter of the law? Are you sure that you want to affirm your conviction of others under the law? The Pharisees were willing to overlook David's multiple occasions of breaking the law. Or they were also willing to overlook the priests who would technically violate the law by working on the Sabbath, yet they were guiltless because the work they did was work for the Lord and the temple. Sabbath day was actually when they were working the most. But even the most insane and corrupt Pharisee would never have condemned a priest who was performing their priestly duties. So why were the Pharisees not condemning David or the Levite priests for technically breaking the law, but they were willing to convict the disciples for breaking man's traditions or their man-made statutes? Galatians 3, 11-14 for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing be given or given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's referring to all the children of God. For additional reference, see also Romans chapter 2, 17 through 24. So off the top of my head, there are around 80 million laws of the United States, and that's codes, regulations, and statutes that are corporate bylaws. Everyone under this system is a lawbreaker. It is impossible to keep these laws. Every single one of them is condemned in some fashion underneath these codes, regulations, and statutes. Everyone was a lawbreaker under the Pharisees' private law additions made to the Law of Moses in which there was no salvation anyway. And Jesus referenced Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings or sacrifices. And David broke the law, and it wasn't going to be the last time. But he was not condemned. If the Pharisees, or the elders, or the governing body understood mercy, they would not have condemned both the guiltless victims and those who are guilty of breaking their statutes and codes. Legalisms do not bring glory to God, they suffocate the people. And those Pharisees and the JW leadership, who are also guilty and condemned under the letter of the law, seem to be intent on being sacrificial in order to deflect on those that they have condemned, and in doing so they have condemned themselves. Their feet hurry in order to run to badness, power, control, and dishonest gain through situationally applied legalism. This is satanic, because when legalism was released, in, or if it's released in full force, everyone would be condemned by their own traditions. 
David inquiring for a weapon is an example of people trying to use the house of God in order to get things that the house of God was never designed for. I, I don't know what a Raphite sword was doing in a house of the Lord. I read Exodus and I don't recall any instructions that an armory be kept in the tabernacle or any such facilities. And why was David's trophy there? I don't know at this time. But David praises the sword, which uh, no doubt was of advanced metallurgic quality. Yet this praised weapon hidden in the house of God did not do much for its former master. At this point, too, David could have turned around and realized that God had already given him a victory before. And here was a literal reminder of that victory. Maybe that's why the sword had made it to this location at this time. When we are in a hard place, we can be led to give praise to things of substance, which, in comparison to God, are themselves immaterial. One would have hoped that when David gripped the hilt of the sword, he would have remembered... Our voice is starting to give out. He would have remembered that God had previously empowered him to slay a Rephite warrior with a stone and a sling. But instead of being elated, remembering that God could defend him, David makes another decision. He chooses to flee to Gath, which, if you recall, was the home city of Goliath and Goliath's kin. David seems to think that it's a good idea to flee to Gath because it's the enemy's camp and he can hide here from Saul. And he can hide there as a Hebrew man carrying a massive weapon of one of their former champions as a champion of Israel. And for some reason, David thought that he was going to be able to blend in with the Philistines. So when we are in fear of the wrong thing, it destroys our judgment. When there is a season of difficulty, we, in our fear, can try to self-medicate with ungodly activities through vices and distractions. When we are in a time of silence and turmoil, we may turn away from God to other things, like um, alcohol, for example. So David was trying to comfort himself in his own strength and his own supposed cleverness. He thought, there's no way Saul's going to pursue me here, and he probably was right. But of course, David was so famous that the locals immediately recognized him, and they even knew of a folk song of Israel. But more interestingly, who did they say David was? King of the land. Now, David was not the technical king yet, but the Philistines knew enough to recognize that David was likely to ascend to the throne of Israel. And David, of course, was now worried. He had hoped to blend in with the Philistines, but the Philistines had quite succinctly dashed David's hopes and dreams under these circumstances. Now remember, David was in these circumstances by his own choices. There is nothing in this chapter of God directing him to make any of these choices. So at this point again, what did David do? Did he cry out to God and ask, what do you want me to do? What can I do? that'll make this into a better situation. And no, instead he turned to his own plan and he humiliated himself before his enemies by pretending to be a lunatic. David put on the persona of being insane. So David was still lying, not with his words, but with conduct. So previously he lied to the priest who he probably should have caught on that something wasn't right. You have a champion of Israel with no men with him asking for five loaves when he supposedly had men with him. Five loaves wouldn't go very far. Asking for a weapon from a priest because he didn't have any of his armaments with him. But, yeah. But David was snowballing. And instead of dealing with his errors when they were small, he allowed them to go downhill, and things were getting uglier and more outrageous. We see this as a common pattern. With XJWs, we can see this with the society, with their false prophecies, their progression of sin, 
and their weaknesses that weak men refuse to deal with, and now they are sitting in complete shame. This David is a child of God with saliva running down his beard, scratching on the door. This Let is a child of God, a supposed or alleged brother of Christ, a alleged channel of God saying that babies are enemies of God. This Splain says that the generations overlap from Jesus saying this generation, speaking of the current time in which they were living, that the parents of abused children who do not keep quiet should be sentenced to death at Armageddon by disfellowshipping. So this supposed madman was the guy who killed our champion. This madman is the man who led the other soldiers who killed our other champions. So David's reputation was now reduced. He was being mocked, despised and his life was contaminated. But it did work to accomplish his overall goal of hiding because he was convincing enough that the king wanted David out of his presence. Let me put forth a hypothetical alternative scenario where David turned around, but at this point he'd still made choices that led him to Gath. Instead, however, he humbled himself before God and asked that this horrible situation be used for his purposes. What if David had had an opportunity instead to be incorporated into the court and work to influence the nation to change its ways? Today, many seem interested in justifying behavior, such as saying that David's plans seem to work. You know, they rationalize it instead of learning from it. I would be curious as to how things would have turned out if he hadn't stuck to his plans and instead had gone with God's plans. But not all stories recorded in the scriptures are things to be emulated or are approved by God. They are recorded for us to learn. Smart people learn from their mistakes. We all make them. Wiser people learn from other people's mistakes. David in these examples was not demonstrating faith. He was demonstrating weakness. Was it his flesh that allowed him to survive, or was it grace? I would argue grace. Of course, Father God seems to get criticism from mankind when he shows mercy and when he shows judgment. But God showed mercy to David, just as he showed mercy to Saul. In the previous chapters, did Saul get struck by lightning when he was pursuing David to Samuel's house? No. He was given a gift of being overwhelmed by the presence of God, an opportunity to turn back. Saul was arrested by the Holy Spirit, and he was shown what his life used to be like and what it might have returned to, even as Saul was in the pursuit of sin. What is God's kindness supposed to do? It is supposed to lead people to choose repentance. That is why God always gives instruction or warning and time before pulling back the mercy. Did David pull back and learn? The answer is not found here in 1 Samuel 21. It's found in Psalms 34, or Psalm 34. When you read this chapter with a lens of 1 Samuel 21, it should pull on something inside of you. And I do recommend reading the 34th Psalm. So the watchtower, those in it, the leadership, they can change. They can pull back, they can repent, and they can stop humiliating themselves because God will humiliate you as well. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hand of the living God. When you lie, it messes your life up and you're affecting the lives of other people. Turn back from evil and do good. Your little legal department and your masters will not and cannot save you. Oh, thank you. That's what I had prepared for today. Um, I will have a testimonial or commentary coming out shortly, and also the uh, for consideration, where the giants come from after the deluge. Uh, I really hope to get out before the end of the week. Been kind of busy and crazy around here, but that's all, and I hope you all have a good night.